Hey, it's Jay. And I just received an interesting letter from an old friend, Josh Ritter. I'm inviting you to come to my house for an exclusive interview. This could be a great opportunity for you to promote your little YouTube channel, as I know your fans would be thrilled to hear my unique and inspiring story. As you have no doubt seen, I appeared in the Beach Bum with my good friend Matthew McConaughey, as well as the right stuff on Disney+. Plus. You can also see me in a multitude of commercials advertising crucial products which promote the general welfare. Like vape pens! I also have dedicated my life to building multiple houses throughout the community, all of which I own and occasionally occupy. I also share the secrets of my unparalleled success with some pretty familiar faces. Picks and closed. I'm very busy making money, but always happy to share my time with an old friend. His accomplishments are impressive, especially since he did all this while raising special needs twins. So let's meet up with Josh and hear his story. brother. Hey. How you doing, How you doing? Man? Thanks for coming. Oh. Welcome to my humble abode. Pretty nice. Thank you. Come on in. All right. Can I get you a drink? Wow, this is amazing. Thank you. It's, uh, it's not my biggest house, but um, I like it. It's nice. We'll get away. So who are these people here? Oh, that, uh, that's just what that came with the frames. I gotta, I gotta put my family in there. I haven't gotten around to it. So busy working, making money. This is my little, uh, little private hideaway. Oh, can I get you a drink, by the way? This is amazing. Um, Dude, it's 8.30 in the morning. Suit yourself. Mm. This place is incredible. In your letter that you sent me, mm -hmm. you mentioned you built this yourself with your own hands? Yeah, well, not this one, actually. I, I, my other houses I did. I did build them myself. And um, this one was more, uh, you know, I've been so busy making money. I'm just like, why am I gonna spend time building another house? So I was like, I'll just make it easy myself. I'll buy this one. Let's just get right into it. Yeah. I I've been dying to ask these questions. Now you worked with Matthew McConaughey recently. Oh yes, yes. The Beach Bum. The Beach Bum. It's a funny story. You know, Matthew and I have been looking for a project to do, do together for years. Uh, we're very close. One day I got a call from Harm that's uh, Harmony Corinne, the writer-director of the movie. And I call him Harm. And he was like, hey, JR, uh, listen, I got this idea for the movie called The Beach Bum. I would love for you to be a part of it. And I kind of like McConaughey as like the son-in-law of the main character. And he told me about it. And I was like, you know, I think McConaughey would be better as the lead. Look, if you're not generous in this business, you're not going to make it. Next thing you know, we're on set, Star Island. It's a lot of fun. It was a good time. And you got to hang out with Isla Fisher? I did, uh, but we were very professional on set. I can tell you that. There was nothing weird, so. Um, and you can't talk about off set? I, I probably shouldn't. <laughs> you know, it's funny, Jay. I was, um, was talking to the Dalai Lama the other day, and he told me something, and it always stuck with me. Hey, what are you guys doing in my house? Run, Jay, run, run, run! What? What? Hey, 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 nice robe? Cover your ass, I'm not going back to prison. What happened? Shut up and run, man! Josh? Josh? Yo, Josh. I think we lost him. Who, who was that guy? Oh, man. We gotta talk. So I invited Josh over to my place so that we could really talk about his career and try to get to the bottom of what just happened. So buddy. Yeah. Can you just tell me what's going on? Yeah, um, all right, obviously that's not my house. Here's the truth. I have gotten a lot of work over the years I'm really proud of. Well, the, the beach bum is, is real. Yeah. You were in that movie. Yes, that was and real. And you met all those famous people. Yes, I did, and that was amazing, Matthew McConaughey. Not old friends with him, Harmony Corinne, not old friends with him. <laughs> and I just turned 45 and I kind of thought I'd be a little further along in my life by now. I guess I'm a little insecure about that and I just felt a need to sort of put on a facade that would be impressive. You do have an incredible story. Yeah, no, I'm proud of a lot of stuff in my life and I'm proud of how far I've come. You know, like the Beach Bum, for example, like I found out that they were filming a Matthew McConaughey movie in, uh, in Miami. My uh, agent got me an audition and I went to the audition for a small role and got a call back for a much bigger role. 
and I found out I booked it. That's and I awesome. couldn't believe it. It was, you know, and then I read the talent in it, and it was like Matthew McConaughey, Isla Fisher, Snoop Dogg, Jonah Hill, Jonah Hill, Zach Efron. Oh my gosh! Even Jimmy <laughs> Buffett was in it, and then Harmony Korine, who's, you know, he did Spring Breakers. He wrote the movie Kids, which traumatized a generation back in the, <laughs> in the mid '90s. Yes, um, I remember that movie. <laughs> really, really gifted Have no guy. Legs, yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I have no legs. I have no legs. It was a brutal movie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was wonderful though. And he's got a unique vision. I mean, he's a real, I mean, I hate to use the word, it's so cliche, but he's a real artist. He's a real visual artist. He's unique in his style and his vision. And um, I, I, I was well aware of all of this when I found out he was directing and writing the movie. So yeah, I got to do that. It was great. So I'm, I'm just listening to you right now, like the real Josh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just hear your passion kind of coming through your voice. Yeah. And it's just this world that I know has been so important to you for so long. I mean, you've been in it for like 20 years or something now. Yeah, ever since I got out of school, yeah. When you were younger, I mean, did you envision yourself being an actor at all? By the time I was in high school, I had a lot of different ideas what I wanted to do. But when I was a kid, I just, I always, like I grew up, we grew up together in Long Valley. Uh, we had New a, Jersey. <laughs> yeah, in Long Valley, New Jersey. And uh, we had a, a big yard, like two acres of property, a big driveway with um, big U-shaped driveway with uh, a forest that my father had planted within that U. You know, that whole area is spread out. There's not like tons and tons of neighbors close by. And I had friends, but I spent a lot of time outside as a kid, just by myself, just making up worlds and inhabiting them with characters and coming up with all kinds of fun scenarios and, you know, uh, science fiction and fantasy. And I just, I loved it. I just loved it. I was so happy. I liked playing with other kids, but I was really happy to be alone and just run around through my property and just having adventures. And that's really important for acting, I found out later, mm -hmm. because you you have to inhabit. You have to take, a lot of times you have to take very little and inhabit a whole world with it. You always talk about like you're, you're envisioning yourself as a character. It's never really you. Like a, it's, it's always somebody that you're portraying to be. It's really taking a piece of yourself and then exploding that piece of yourself <laughs> into a different person. Even if I watch something I've done in like, like a commercial or whatever, uh, if I'm enjoying it, I'll often think of it as a different person, mm -hmm. just automatically. I'll be like, look at how ridiculous this guy is, you know? <laughs> and it's me, but it's like, it just feels different. I won big with Week for Life scratch-offs from the Florida Lottery, and I get paid every week for the rest of my life. So I'm freezing myself to live longer. One of the things I always loved about the arts and entertainment industry, it's, I mean, you're sort of, I almost said, your imagination is the limit. I can't believe I almost said that. <laughs> but it's true. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know. Falcor flies by from never ending story. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe we can insert that. I've always been loved writing too. As a kid, I started writing stories when I was like nine, and I mm -hmm. loved it because I just loved the idea. Just create whatever you could create anything. You know, the, the the real world is often so disappointing. You know, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's really dark, and sometimes it's it's really boring. And the idea that you can sort of even for a period of time inhabit a world where there's rules that make sense. You know, yeah. that people behave in, a, in, a, in a, a consistent way. There's just something so pleasing about that, about That's having cool. like a puzzle that fits together mm -hmm. and all makes sense, you yeah. know? Yeah. Uh, and you don't really have that in the real world. Things don't, a lot of things don't make sense in the real world. If that's the world you want, you can kind of create it with a story or whatever. Uh, and that has always been a draw to me. The entertainment industry is just sort of like whatever you want it to be. The possibilities are endless. Less, 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 less. And so when I was in high school, um, I, uh, you know, I was considering becoming an English teacher. That was my first thought because I wanted to be like Robin Williams and Dead Poet Society. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> my captain, my captain. I went to college to major in literature with the intention of becoming a teacher. And uh, the reason I got that got derailed was because freshman year, some of my friends were going to, 
I, you know, I met some friends and stuff, and I'm like, where are you guys going? They're walking past, like, oh, we're going to audition for the play. I'm like, you guys actors? They're like, no, we just think it'd be fun just to audition for a play. And I was like, yeah, I'll audition for a play. Once I learned that process on stage of solving problems and collaborating and finding the truth of the script and getting closer to the bone of what you're trying to do and having being surrounded with talented, creative people who are also trying to get there yeah. and helping each other. It's sure. a very communal feeling, no, yeah. not comp competitive. It was a sense of let's all create this together, and that was it. I couldn't, I could not go to teaching after that. I couldn't do it. <laughs> I was just way too enamored. So yeah. that's how that started. I mean, you've been hilarious since I met you. We met <laughs> in what, fifth grade. I think so. Yeah, fifth we were grade, like ten. Yeah. I mean, I just, have, I just remember always cracking up, hanging out with you. Yeah, no, um, we always made each other laugh, which is one of the, you know, one of the reasons we still hang out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good friends. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I mean, even in high school, like in hostile situations, mm -hmm. you would diffuse anything with just a little humor. So you join a comedy troupe, right? In, in college. college, yes. And you know, that's funny too, because like that was a, an even bigger window into sort of the creative world that I really found satisfying. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, well, there's three friends of mine who are all in the acting program with me. And we were all kind of writers. We were all kind of dabbled in comedy. And we started a comedy troupe, the Peanut Gallery. Hey. What's a nice girl like you doing in a place like this? Oh, <laughs> God, your breath is really bad. <laughs> Damn, it's really good. <laughs> Isn't there anything I can do about my funky bad breath? <laughs> sit down together, we'd brainstorm ideas, came up with sketch ideas, everybody would go home and write some sketches, we'd all get together and help each other develop them, and then we'd get them on their feet and we'd have one person would direct the other three, and we created like an over an hour long show and did all the production work ourselves, everything, filled up the, the theater for this one performance, and it was amazing. That's it, cool. All the jokes worked. All the time, everything came together. None of us knew what we were doing. Yeah. But it worked. The idea that you can create something that made people laugh, that you could write the words of it, that you could write the scenarios and then perform it and people laugh, that, it was That's so empowering. I've always been a practical person in my life. I knew that I had to do something like day job. You know, I had to have something concrete. Right. Oh, to hold you, yeah. But I couldn't, to sustain you. I couldn't come up with anything that I was willing to dedicate myself to. Right. Because I and I knew it was risky to go into the entertainment industry. The concept of making it, you know? Yeah. There's actors out there who you would recognize on movies and TV yeah. who are just scraping by, you yeah. know? Yeah. Then you have that top percentage of celebrities. Right. Most actors, they work, they work, they work, they don't work. Yeah. Year, two years, whatever it is. Even really successful ones. It it's just the nature of the business. Yeah. Um and a lot of jobs at the lower level, they just don't pay. So m most people have other jobs, they have other sources of income. I was trying to crack that code. And uh, you know, mm -hmm. when you're 20, you're like, I could do this. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I thought. Um, uh. I had, I worked tons of day jobs. Claire! Don't let HIPAA give you a heart attack. I'm not a real doctor. I did so many jobs, and at night I would go do a play, or I was in a band, you know, for through high school, through college, after college, I was always in a band. You, some years made a lot of money, some years didn't make any money, mm. and just trying to find that way in to a, a career. It's brutal, it's a brutal lifestyle. Yeah. But, I, but you know, the funny thing is people think, well, you know, well, why would you choose it? It's almost like you don't choose it. The, the thrill, that high of being on stage, of, of performing and doing something that's out of your comfort zone and beyond yourself, right? I mean, there's <laughs> definitely an addiction element to it. Yeah. I, I mean, there's no getting around that. And I don't think it's a surface thing necessarily, especially if you have an audience. It's essentially you're giving out your energy to the audience mm -hmm. and they're giving it back to you what feels like a thousand fold. Yeah. It's that relationship. Mm -hmm. It's that sense of 
bringing something to people sure. that people like, that people are willing to pay for, mm -hmm. uh, an ex a visceral experience that you can't quantify, hmm. that people are like, take my money so I can have this experience. There's just something magical about it. I mean, really, it's like magic to me. When people get to choose how they spend their time, that's the world they go to sure. every time. Yeah. And whether, and whether that's listening to an audio book in your car, driving home from work or, you know, uh, you know, putting on music when you have friends over. I mean, that is a consistent part of society. True. And I was like, that's where people are happy. That's where people are open. Mm -hmm. That's where people commune. Mm -hmm. And I said, that is the world I want to be a part that's of. Cool. I want to be a part of the oasis of everyday life. I remember all the way back to high school, mm. you're, you're a musician as well. Yeah. On yeah. top of your acting and com comedy and everything else. Yeah. Um, and you had this really amazing band back then yeah. called Gordian Gordy Knot. Gordian Knot, yeah. Right? Gordian Knot formed in 94. Mm -hmm. There was at the time there was five of us all from the same class all friends of yours, too Yeah, I played keyboards I had taken about a year and a half of piano lessons when I was like around 11 or 12 and I just couldn't get interested in it uh, Then I started listening to the doors <laughs> and that's what got me interested. And I was like, oh I could create my own <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah, I learned to light my fire. Yeah, <laughs> I learned to break on through on the piano You know the day destroys the night with the band, we, um, you know, we learned a lot of Tom Petty songs and um, we learned a lot of uh, Beatles songs and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And we wrote our own stuff too. It was just fun. We weren't the best band, we weren't the best musicians, but we were friends and we had a great time. And that was the sense even through after Gordian Knot and everything, it was just this sense of this is fun. It's fun to be here. It's fun to watch these guys. It's fun to be around these guys and the music's good. You know, and they do a good job. We kind of peaked in like 99. We released a, an EP mm -hmm. called The Ballad of Ella Valley. Hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, we sold a bunch know. of those CDs. And um, and then we opened for Liz Fair at, uh, at a concert. And then, you know, we just moved on. And then when I got out of college, I got back in touch with all the vocalists from Gordian Knot. So it was mm -hmm. Ben, Tim, and, and Dave. And we were like, let's play an acoustic vocal band. And that's how Strange River started. Yep. And then we played sometimes like six or eight times a month, bars, local and bars, restaurants, yeah. and, yeah. and uh, even coffee houses, everything. And we did that for about I don't know six or seven years. Yeah. And we released a couple albums. And sometimes you make a lot of money, and sometimes you don't. Mm -hmm. And this is always the nut to crack in this industry. Mm -hmm. It's just like you know you get so close to like really making good money. Mm -hmm. And then it just all disappears for X amount of time. You just don't have the control. Like right. there's no path. Right. It's not like you can intern in a band mm -hmm. after college and then get into a successful band. You know, it's, yeah, it doesn't yeah. work that way. Corporate band. Yeah, exactly. It's like <laughs> you know, the ladder. You can intern as an actor at the public theater. It's right. Like, no, <laughs> right. It's not a thing. And I've met plenty of people who went to grad school for acting mm -hmm. at good schools, spent like $150,000 to, to go through the school program. And I know people who worked in Hollywood for a while after that and worked on TV for a while and then they stopped, you know, for whatever reason. It's just even with all the education and connections and everything, you, you just, there's, there's a lot no of luck guarantee. In there. There's a lot of luck. Yeah, there's, there's luck and there, you know, the truth of the matter with acting, there's no control. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't control if I have an audition coming up. <laughs> if, if there's an audition that I'd be right for, I can't control if they want to see me. Mm -hmm. If they do want to see me, I can't control if they see what I think they should see. Mm -hmm. Or they might be like, you know, you lose out on roles. I lost out on roles because I was too tall. Mm -hmm. And they said, you were really better for this, but it's going to look weird with your height and everything. So I've lost roles because my hair was too long. And mm -hmm. I'm like, I can cut it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. But they just can't see it that way. You know, yeah. I mean, it's stuff like that. Right. And you think it's the talent and it has to be there. The skill has to be there. But when it comes to booking, so much is reliant on your appearance, your energy. You know, if it's not what they're looking for and you can't always tell what that is, yeah, there's nothing you can do. I've always come back to writing. Mm -hmm. I can write something and that's mine. Mm -hmm. I can write something like the stuff I'm writing now involving my kids, which I guess we'll talk about next. Okay. That's something only I can do. Yes. Like somebody, I can't delegate that. Somebody can't come in and and write a better version of my stories yeah. because they're mine. Sounds genius. That's because it is, Leia. When did you meet your wife, Karen? That's when I, I met Karen in 2005. Okay. And a few months later, I moved into her apartment in Brooklyn with her. Hmm. She was like super 
sophisticated and cool and you know. She was into, into music as well. She was very successful. She was in a band called Lunar Plexus in Boston in the 90s. I remember when I met her, you know, I was kind of, I was trying to be charming. <laughs> <laughs> so I was mean, <laughs> you know. Classic kind of, guy, yeah. I was insecure. Yeah. <laughs> and I was feeling very uncomfortable. And so I kind of like, you know, I, I really wanted to impress her. Yeah, I was just like, oh, you're a real musician? And she's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh. And then she actually said to me when we first met, she goes, are you always this rude to people you don't know? And I was like, what do you mean? And I thought I was being funny. Yeah, fun. right. She goes, I'm ready to leave. And I said, don't leave, don't leave. I'm, uh, let's start over. Mash made in heaven. Yeah. Uh, eventually, after after the initial date, but you guys start to write like some music together. Yeah. Is there any chance we might be able to hear yeah, something? Yeah, you know, I can play um, <laughs> the first song we wrote together, January of two thousand six. Uh -huh. uh, we just released the album a few months ago called Illuminated. The band is Modern Day Alchemy, and this was the opening song in the album. And it's the first song we wrote together called Kept Inside. So I'll just play a little bit of the so you can get a sense of how it feels. So this album you just released in October, yeah. correct? We've recorded the songs slowly over the years, sometimes releasing them as sort of like um, acoustic versions. Because mm -hmm. we're just an acoustic band live. Um, I'm gonna make sure I link their band in, in, yeah. in the comment, in the uh, description. Yes, yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> this full album we released, most of the stuff was from 2006, 2007. We met a producer, uh, he actually approached us, uh, Christopher Mull, was uh, in uh, the Postmarks, um, which was very successful, really creative band, good stuff there. Mm. Um, and we just collaborated with him for a while and he's a wonderful producer. He really upped our game, really brought a lot of quality to the music. And yeah, and it feels great to release it because it's just mm. been in the works for so many years. Yeah, And it's just one of those things you just sometimes, things that you think will take a year, like creative endeavors especially, they take 15 years. It is so cool that you just, you have this product. Like I, I look back on my hands mm -hmm. videos and stuff, you know, I kind of started as fun. Actually it was, a, it was the idea was to start it to, to teach other people how to do this and that, right. you know, different DIY jobs around the house. But I look back at my library now and I'm like, wow, you know, it's really neat to have that. And I imagine it's similar in the fact that all those years of your your passion, different periods of time that you guys were going through, and you have this amazing final product. Yeah, <laughs> it's. I mean, it's really satisfying because it's just like it's just so much work went into it. Yeah, and we were never in a position where we could just rent out a studio and, and record for like a month. You mm -hmm. know, it's not like anybody was paying us for anything. So we would have to just little snippet here, little snippet there. And yeah. man, it took a lot longer than I thought. But I'm really I'm really proud of it. And um, it's a it's it's a great album. It's really just sort of the culmination of all that work. And uh, yeah, I mean, I feel really fortunate because you know, in spite of you know whatever challenges that you know we've come up with, especially like I was saying, in a, in a in an industry where careers are almost impossible to forge, I always do have. Look what we did, though. Yeah. You know, I have that satisfaction. <laughs> We're kind of at the beginning of your relationship with Karen. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys are starting to write together. Mm -hmm. You're both living in Brooklyn now, mm -hmm. yeah. 2006, you said, or yeah. something. Yeah. And um, at this point, uh, you start to audition for different roles. Yeah, that? well, what I wanted to get, like, you know, I had done it off and on before that, and I wanted to get back in. All my experience was theater. In New York, there are a lot of opportunities, but there's a trillion more people fighting for those opportunities. And it's a brutal lifestyle in New York because obviously really expensive. You can't go long periods without working. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's impossible anywhere, but it's really impossible there. I was working day jobs and I was kept trying to crack the code. Well, how, how can I get 
the time to audition for stuff and a couple little things here or there, a lot of stuff didn't pay. Out of the blue, is another thing that happened out of the blue for me and this started the ball rolling again. I get contacted from a uh, professor from college, an acting professor, and she's like, hey, listen, we're going to do this. Uh, she's like, I'm, I'm doing this project at the public theater with Sam Shepard. Mm -hmm. And I was like, and Sam Shepard, you know, is, he's known in the acting world as, you know, being a you know, great actor, and he is. Mm -hmm. In the theater world, he's a playwright. Mm -hmm. He's not just an actor, he's mm -hmm. a playwright. And so he's really well respected in the theater world. So I was like, really? With Sam Shepard? Yeah, yeah. She's like, we're doing this. It's a showcase. Uh, it's not a big deal, but it's a showcase, and we had a guy drop out. Do you want to do it? And I was like, yes. <laughs> and then she's like, okay, well, you know, we'll have to fill out the paperwork. And I said, well, paperwork? She said, oh, well, this is, you know, this, you're going to get paid X amount of money. I don't remember how much it was, but I remember being like blown away by the amount. And I was like, yeah. really? <laughs> And Dude, this is earned money. Yeah, yeah, it was good like, money. You know, yeah, good money, and not just like a hundred dollars stipend at the end of you know three months of work. Right, like right. Actual money, and then she's like, "Yeah, oh, but and it'll get you into the Actors Equity Association, the, the stage union." And I was like, "Really? <laughs> All that out of the blue, right? Out of the blue." And yeah, it was several weeks working with. I met new actors and met Sam Shepard. <laughs> One of the things they they had me do is the music for it. So I, I had my guitar and I would just play different like pieces and, and bits and little things I came up with while uh, you know while the scenes were going on. So it was a really amazing experience. I made money, I got in the actors union, I got to work with Sam Shepard and it was just, you know, and, and I was, after that I was like, I gotta try for another thing. I felt like that was an opportunity that came out of nowhere and I had to honor that, you know? Like there was a reason, there was a reason that happened. Like how do you actually get into that and figure out how you're gonna do the role and and yeah, can it's, you take us through a little bit? I mean, you're sort of led to believe when you're younger that there's a specific process that you're supposed to follow. And that's true to a certain extent, but I've been, you know, I started doing camera work in like 2008 or nine, mm -hmm. when, or actually probably 2010 when I moved down to Florida. And I, I learned a lot through the process. So everybody basically, you learn as you get older, everybody has their own kind of way in. Mm -hmm. So there's no like rule, there's guidelines, but there's no rule how to do it. In context, you eventually get married to Karen and you guys move to Florida. Right, yeah. So so now, right, now so most we, of your auditions are now happening in Florida, right? Exactly, okay. and, and yeah, so we were living together and we got engaged and we got married in 2007 in New York. And Karen's family lived down in Florida and she said, you know, I haven't lived near my family since I was a teenager and I'd like to spend time with them. They're getting older. And I said, yeah, let's do it. So we moved to Florida in 2008. I started working on stage there. And uh, then I started auditioning for camera work for the first time. Ain't nothing free in this life, Jay Bonius. Good, sir. And so, yeah, so the process, you know, there's a lot to go through. Well, can I interrupt you? For yeah, yeah. Guess? Okay, so, I mean, I don't know. This is just kind of off the cuff, but I actually printed out. Oh man! Uh, I printed out a sheet from Sense and Sensibility. <laughs> That's awesome. And um, I thought maybe you could show you know anybody watching who might be interested the process of what what you go through mm -hmm. as an actor. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you get to find out who's directing, uh, who's producing. That's important because sometimes uh, you know, oh well this person does a lot of comedy, so you know this is going to be a comical thing or whatever. They lay out oh, the shoot schedule, the pay, all that stuff. And then they'll send you what's called sides, hmm. which is what this is. It's like a piece of the script. They want you to read uh, in front of the camera to get a sense of if you're right for the role. Okay. Pretty simply. All right. So, so I get the script and the first thing I do is I read everything I can on and the you, script. And you get it before, before the... Yeah, you got to get it like the day before. And then, okay, sense and sensibility. Now, the first thing I would do is read about what that, I'm not familiar with it, I'm aware of it. So maybe I'd read about Sense and Sense, like read about the story, read about what it's about, what are the themes. Exterior, Norland Park Drive Day, a very capable horseman, Edward Ferrars, canters up the gravel drive. Okay, so I already know this guy rides a horse. Maybe okay. arist, uh, you know, aristocratic maybe. So maybe he's a little, you know, upper class, maybe he's got money. He is respectful. He's not comfortable with this Fanny character, so now I know how he feels about Fanny. Mm -hmm. He's not comfortable with her. He doesn't. Okay. He's embarrassed by her. She's embarrassing him on some level. That's important. Maybe he's got some insecurities there. Maybe he really wants to make a good impression. 
these are all the kind of clues you find, right? So now if you want to read, you want to read the, the, the role, it's, we'll start with Fanny's line. Forgive us, Miss Ferrars. My youngest is not to be found this morning. She's a little shy of strangers at present. Naturally, I am also shy of strangers. I am, I am, I am. And I have nothing like her excuse. <sighs> How do you like your view, Mr. F Ferrars? Very much. Your stables are very handsome and beautifully kept, Mrs. Dashwood. Interesting. Cool. Thank you. I wouldn't have been able to do that years ago. So, you know, I learned a lot through the process. I was being a little serious in that. I'd yeah. more exaggerated uh, just to give them options. Maybe do it a little looser. I've always been good at the, the accents, obviously. Um, yeah, it's, it's just Let's a roll a couple of the commercials that you actually landed from these auditions. Okay. You know, yeah. earlier on. Yeah, so. let's do it. Okay. Now here's a guy who needs a big discount on a new mattress. Dave needs to sign this contract right now. Where is he? The 27th floor executive suite. I don't have access to that floor. That's your problem. Karen get pregnant with your two boys, right? Yeah, and so, yeah. Find out you're gonna have twins? Yeah, so we were trying for years to, to have a kid and we really wanted that. Um, and uh, and then one day, you know, the test is positive. You know how it is, with, you know, sure. trying to have kids and that yeah. feeling when you know it's gonna happen. Yes. Uh, we go to the first uh, OB appointment and she says, do twins run in your family? <laughs> And me, having never entertained the possibility that we would have twins, yeah. goes, why? And she's <laughs> like, no, you guys are having twins. And wow. I was like, and I did this while they were talking for about 20 minutes. <laughs> and then we got back in the car and I was driving and I just went, twins is twice as much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's when it hit me. Pregnancy was uneventful. Hmm. Every checkups healthy, everything was going along perfectly until six months she essentially went into preterm labor when she was oh, six man. months pregnant, out of nowhere, out of the blue. Yeah. At the hospital she was on bed rest for a month hmm. and the babies were born at 29 weeks. Aiden was uh, two pounds, six ounces. Hmm. He was born first and they put him in an incubator immediately, brought him out of the room. Noah was born at three pounds, four ounces. I cut the umbilical cord and his lungs collapsed. He instantly stopped breathing. Oh man. And the doctors rushed in, they took him away, and of course we're going there like, what's yeah. going on? They were in the NICU for 11 weeks, hmm. you know, and there was just constant, oh, this one needs a blood transfusion, this one seems jaundiced, this one's heart stopped, this one stopped breathe breathing. There's, every day there was another piece of information. This one has holes in his heart, this one also has holes in his heart. It was just like, Oh so gosh. the emotional uh, roller coaster of that, of course, was horrible. They eventually came home with heart and lung monitors, and you know they would sleep in their little cribs, and usually, you know, I'd, I'd be asleep on the couch. Karen would sleep in the in the bedroom, and I would work during the day, and she wasn't working at that point because her. She was let go while she was in the hospital, which oh. was perfectly legal at the time. Immediately, the the income dropped. I mean, yeah. just dropped. So she's in the hospital for a month, no income. Mm -hmm. I'm working, I was making less money than she was at the time, but I was making hourly money, which meant that if I wanted to visit her, uh, I had to take off work. I had to take care of the house myself. We had pets, you know, all those responsibilities I had to do myself, which meant I wasn't working as much. Right. So the income's just going down. We tried to cancel every service we had to try to save money start going through our savings, you know, it was just this avalanche that just got worse and worse. When the boys finally came home, there were heart and lung monitors and they just didn't sleep. They would both doze off and then I'd doze off on the couch and then the monitors would go off. Mm. And they were loud. Mm. And you jump up and the first thing you have to figure out is which one of them. Yeah. And then is it because they stopped breathing and then you have to revive them and there's little tricks to do that. We didn't have to ever do mouth to mouth or anything, but there were little tricks you have to do mm -hmm. to revive the kids. First year, um, they just they just didn't sleep. 
Mm-hmm. I think about a year and a half, one would sleep for 20 minutes while the other was awake. Then the other would fall asleep for two hours and the first one would be awake. And right. this was 24 hour process. There was never a time they it's were both impossible. sleeping. Impossible. And so, you know, neither of us were sleeping and we'd get help. We'd get friends in, we'd get family members. We have really strong community of people who wanted to help us. Yeah. And so we'd get little breaks here and there, but again, we had no money now. Everything became a problem when you're in that position and you got you to support the kids, not to mention the, the medical stuff and all the stuff that backed up over time because you just didn't have the money to pay it. It's amazing how quickly that becomes a tidal wave. The um, infrastructure of utilities is not set up to prevent going into shutoff. So for FPL, I remember, you know, requesting, um, you know, I don't know if it was a credit on a bill or a pause on the billing or whatever. Well, we'll only do that if you're about to lose your electricity. So you wait until there's no options left and then they say, okay, we'll give you a little bit. And of course the kids always had doctor's appointments. There's always something else going wrong. And when they were around two years old, um, we really noticed that their development was unusual. There was something off. Yeah. Uh, and they always screamed and they never slept. Mm. Uh, the big frustrating part of this too is we'd tell people and they'd be like, dude, that's babies. And I'm like, no, there's something else. There's yeah, something else. Something and they're like, deeper. this right. is parenting. Welcome to parenting. I'm like, yeah. no, there's, this, isn't, yeah. this isn't normal. There's something wrong here. Mm-hmm. Long and short of it is uh, they both got diagnosed uh, severe on the autism spectrum. And um, Noah also got diagnosed with cerebral palsy. Yeah. So that was a whole nother set of challenges. I quit my job because Karen was working again. She was making better money than me. I quit my job so that I could take care of the boys. The amount of paperwork, the amount of applications, um, trying to get Medicaid, trying to get retroactive Medicaid because they did qualify for it. Right. But then getting it is the challenge. Right. Trying to get the social security payments qualified for that too. Mm. All of that stuff, like it, it is a mountain of work. So Karen would go to work every day, you know, on very little sleep. I'd try to stay up with them as much as I could, but you can't, you can't do that indefinitely. You have to sleep. Noah and Aiden, uh, they didn't, they couldn't read, but they had memorized all their little books. So they would go through flipping the pages, reading because they memorized what was on each page. Mm. And they had like 25, 30 books. The two of them would just sit there and just, they learned to count to a hundred. They, I mean, it was like really, really cool to see that stuff. So yeah. we knew they were really smart. And then with Noah, especially, this is where things got weird. He couldn't walk because of the CP. And he had a, a little walker, and he had, you know, SMOs, braces for his legs, and he was getting physical therapy and he was getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And one day he finally started walking. And we were like, oh, this is amazing because mm. we were worried he wouldn't be able to. Right, right. He's two and a half. He started walking and suddenly he's running, he's climbing, and we're just like, victory. Yeah. We felt so great about it. Right. But the irony came in. <laughs> now he's mobile. <laughs> well, no, well, that, yes. Yeah, that became yeah. a danger. Right, right. He stopped talking. Once he started walking, he stopped talking. He didn't want, he had no interest now in books, toys, none of it, interacting even was a difficult thing. Hmm. He wanted physical input. He had low input, yeah. which means that he'd stamp his feet to feel something, you know? Yeah. All hurt, he wanted was- Could hurt himself to feel yeah, something. Yeah, and he would. He'd fall yeah. and hit his head and get up and keep going. Today, I mean, he's, look, he's a happy kid. He's a sweet kid. He can be very affectionate. He's still not really talking, um, but he's happy, you know? So I say, okay, well, this is, you know, this is how it is. Um, he's gonna be 12. He's drinks out of baby bottles, he's still in diapers. That's not ideal. But again, he's happy. So okay, we'll take it. You know? Yeah, yeah. Obviously it's it's heartbreaking, but yeah. To try to keep up with it all. I tell people <clears throat> I lost down. a lot of myself. Yeah. Especially the sleep thing. That was actually the worst. That was That'll worse than the heartbreak insane. of everything. Yeah. I mean that's you know, that's why they use it for interrogation. Because yeah. you, you can't you can't maintain a grip on reality. Now, when they were eight, they took sleep. We got them the correct medication that they could sleep. So they've been sleeping since they were eight. Yeah. But before that, it was hit or miss. Went to sleep specialists. I mean, we tried everything we could think of. It, it, some nights they'd sleep, some nights they wouldn't. You know, maybe they'd go five nights in a row, they would sleep through the night. Like, mm. oh, it's amazing. Yeah. And then the next week they're up every night. Oh. So that constant being ripped out of sleep by the sound of screaming or, you know, they also got very into, you know, uh, 
they like to smear, oh, as they say. Oh, yeah, yeah. They like to just take their clothes off and pee everywhere, and this was just fun for them. They yeah. would wake up in the middle of the night really happy and energetic and just tear the room to shreds having a party. Oh. And, you know, we would, three in the morning, we'd get up, Karen would scrub the carpet, she'd scrub the walls, change the sheets, I'd have the boys in the shower, I'm scrubbing them. Yeah. And this became a regular thing. Hello, hello, my name is Joshua Ritter. And I, thank you, I deserve that. And I am the father of autistic twins. Mm, it's okay. God only gives you what you can handle, right? <laughs> it's tough when you're raising special needs kids. It's not just the stuff they do, it's the people who give you advice. I got strangers coming up to me in public, sometimes in the midst of a crisis, telling me everything I'm doing wrong. <laughs> These people always have two things in common. Number one, they're experts on how to raise special needs kids. Number two, they've never raised special needs kids. <laughs> Another thing people like to ask me is if I've seen the latest autism-related TV show. Because that's how I want to spend my time. <laughs> This could tear a relationship apart, a marriage apart. It usually but, does. But instead, you guys both moved into each other more, yeah. you know, and depended on each other and became yeah. this uh, like superstar team. Yes, we did. Know? Yeah. And I'm not I'm not even, you know, gonna be humble about that. Yeah, yeah. It did. And and <laughs> one of the things is that, you know, we were always good at working together. Mm -hmm. Like on a practical level, it's like we were always good at being a team. We we're always good. I used to joke uh, in my stand-up mm -hmm. routine, it's like, remember, we're on the same team, it's the kids who are the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's, that's sort of like a, an exaggerated version of how we felt. We felt like we were on the same team and we had to deal with this situation. I think it's 80% or something of couples with special needs kids break up. Wow. And I understand why, because a part of it too is that you start associating this, your partner with the kids, mm -hmm. like there's no separation. The association is stress. Mm. And so a lot of parents I think will, you know, they, they see the other parent and it just reminds them of all the stress of it, of sure. life and getting away from that. They, they find the freedom in getting away from the whole thing and not getting away as a couple necessarily. Yeah, yeah. Which is something that we always tell other couples when they're about to have kids. I'm like, go on dates, go on dates, go on dates. It's important, it's so important. I mean, anybody should do yeah. that anyway. Yeah. But to remind yourselves that you're something outside of parents. Yeah. To remind yourselves of that. Because people, and I don't blame them, but people get into that cycle and now they have no association outside of the kids. During this period I was acting, I, I didn't have a job, so the one job I could do is I could act. Cause yeah. Because I would get work Right. get paid sometimes a lot of money and K Karen would make arrangements with her work to watch the kids so that I could do this, yeah. get a little chunk of money yeah. and then go back. But it was more than that, the emotional release of doing something that felt like it had purpose and results. I loved going to auditions. I loved being in that space where I felt like I was doing something oh, yeah. that felt good. It gets you, know? you out of the, you know, yeah. the, the, the kind of the nightmare that you're Yeah, you're it facing. was an escape from it and it was yeah. a sense of achievement and it was a sense that my skills were being rewarded. It's not released yet, but you have been writing collections of stories about your, your sons. Yes, the goal was to, to tell these stories. I'd like to read them live, but even just have them on print sort of as like, I don't want to say a gift, it sounds so arrogant, but just it's like it's an act hopefully of generosity that, that other parents can get a sense of like, they can laugh at me dealing with this challenge and being unable to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Because that's what they're going through, but they're too close to laugh at their own experience. Yeah. So they can recognize that in me, mm -hmm. and that'll give them some catharsis. They'll give them some funny, to, you know, some release. And so yeah, I've been writing stories that are, you know, they're comical, and um, tell the real story of the experience. And I've gotten a few of them published. Uh, one of them uh, was called uh, You Must Let Go of the Trapeze, which is about taking them to Trampoline World. And that one won a couple awards, which I'm very proud of. Can we hear just a little bit of, your, uh, of one of them? I'm not gonna read the whole story because it's long, but I'll read a segment of it. And so sure. I'll give you a setup here. Um, mm -hmm. It's summertime. Uh, they're about three years old. The twins are three years old. Um, there's nowhere we can afford to send them because special needs camps are expensive. So we have them. 
Karen's working. I have them all summer. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough money to pay for a nanny. We do a little bit, mm -hmm. but it's mostly on me. Mm -hmm. So I'm like gearing up for this challenge of this summer where I have them. There's no, no school, obviously. And uh, I take them to the park and then uh, there's a brewery that I've taken them to before and the owners are very cool and everything. I said, no, screw it, I'm gonna take them to the brewery now. I haven't played at the park for a while. So this is me at the brewery with the boys. Yep. Here we go. I leaned against a pillar and took a sip of my beer. The boys laughed as they ran around like little maniacs, banging the brewery walls with their hands and comically bumping into each other. Noah shouted and stomped the ground with his feet as Aiden sang and stacked the giant Jenga blocks of wood into towers. It was beautiful to see them so happy and at ease, and I permitted myself a satisfied sigh as I watched them play. My daily life may be chaotic, and the task of raising these boys may at times be a frustrating, thankless experience, but at that moment I felt perfectly at ease with it all. It was one of those rare instances of alignment that come, seemingly out of nowhere, and remind you that peace and hope are always a possibility. I reflected on this with gratitude, and that's when Noah had an atomic poop explosion. I heard nothing. I saw no signs of strain in his face, but before long, I knew. First by the unmistakable stench, then the lining of Noah's pockets as they peeked out of his pants. Oh, no. They had magically turned from white to brown. Oh. Upon seeing this, I realized to my horror, the explosion blew right past his diaper. Noah slowly reached his hand towards his waistband and I snapped into crisis mode. <laughs> to have this happen at the park was a crisis, but in a brewery, that was a catastrophe. I had to get them out of there before he touched anything, and before the patrons eating and drinking noticed what happened. But before I could act, I saw the brewery's owner approach. Hey man, good to see you, he said naively. Sorry, I replied as I grabbed my glass and crushed my nearly untouched beer in one magnificent gulp. <laughs> Gotta go! I tossed the boys simultaneously into the stroller and, forgoing the usual crucial safety straps, popped off the foot brake and sprinted for the door like an ancient Greek Olympian, piloting his gross chariot to certain victory. I tore through the parking lot, down the street, and across the intersection. I sprinted through the park's tennis courts and slalomed between a score of confounded players, arriving, finally arriving at the empty parking lot in the safety of my van. Relieved to have gotten there, out of there unscathed, I lifted Noah out of the stroller and stripped his clothes off, intending to wipe him down and put on clean clothes. But as soon as I ripped the last article of clothing from his slippery body, I gasped in horror. The explosion had been epic like an upside-down Krakatoa erupting its lava flows and pyroclastics onto the surrounding landscape of Noah's body. He stood calm in the breeze, glistening in the fading sun, bare naked, covered in brown from neck to toe. He looked as though he'd just returned from Woodstock. Some had even gotten in his hair. In his hair! <laughs> Undeterred by his coated body, he leaned casually, almost insultingly so, against the bumper of our van. He glanced down at his chest, and to my horror, started smearing the mess around with his hands, captivated by the texture. Oh, no. His brother was laughing in obvious glee, and I, the dad, the authority, the protector and solver of problems, stood completely frozen as my mind raced to a million different plans of action, immediately discarding each as hopelessly inadequate. It's I, called brown ale, yeah. <laughs> but ale is spelled A-I-L. Uh, so, oh, wow. <laughs> the play of words. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it. You're a full-time dad, yeah. going through all this stuff with your sons, but you do actually find, amazingly, somehow how find these big roles. Yeah. And audition, and then land them. Yeah, um, I, I've, I've done a lot of commercials. I've done some good TV shows. Uh, the right stuff was, was really exciting because I, that was a recurring role. On a, on a series. And I think there were, you know, unfortunately it didn't go past the first uh, season, but there were, I think, eight episodes in the show. I was on five of them. Sending destruct command. Wait, have you confirmed trajectory down? Is the rocket headed for civilian population? Flight MA-1 is still within range destruction. You are about to kill an astronaut, son. Are you sure? Flight altitude decreasing now at 14K. Separation is yellow. It was about the space program. The story started in 1959, so you deal with Alan Shepard and um, I almost said Glenn Close, but that's not. <laughs> uh, John Glenn. John Glenn. John Glenn. Yeah. Glenn Close. <laughs> yeah. I got to go to uh, Univ Universal uh, Studios in the in the back lots there, 
and they filmed, they built these sets. It was so immersive. It was unbelievable. They built like an actual um, mission command, hmm. you know, and with the consoles, with the ashtrays built in, just like they had, you know, yeah. I mean, it, and they, and usually, you know, on a set, they do, you, know, you do with like the back wall and maybe a side wall or something. This was a full room, big hmm. room, ceiling, floor, all of it was period. The costumes, you know, the, the props, the pens. I mean, they had people like on these big productions, massive, massive amounts of people making sure everything is the way it's supposed to be, the continuity. Hmm. They, they had an eyeglasses master, or he was an ex, he was a property master, worked on huge projects. And he would go to an extra and he'd say, you can't wear those glasses. And he would say, oh, I'm sorry, I thought these were period. He goes, well, that style wasn't in vogue until five years after this took oh. place. Here, these these were what you would have worn. You know, yeah, like right. that wow. kind of detail. Wow. People were passionate, yeah. passionate about their work, really good at it. Yeah. Hundreds of people collaborating. It was an amazing experience. Put me up in a hotel. They paid for my travel. Uh, I even got my food reimbursed, my food expense reimbursed. I had a nice hotel suite a lot of the time. This, when I was going through so much at home, so much struggle, and no satisfaction, no sense of moving forward. Right. To get a job like that, <laughs> where I was being compensated for my efforts, for all the work I've had, you know, like yeah. whatever talent or whatever you want to say, technician's experience you bring to the table, to, to, to feel like it's appreciated, to feel like, yes, you're, you're doing great, here's some money, you know, mm -hmm. I had a big trailer. I mean, it was just like, it was a dream. Mm -hmm. And I spent months doing that off and on. And I would drive up and I'd do some scenes, I'd drive back home and uh, had this, you know, just this wonderful experience, made really good money that year, which was a huge, huge help for us financially. Each Bum was an amazing experience too. Yeah. I had a whole week on set. Uh, McConaughey was a, you know, a, there's a scene where he actually comes up. You're the groom, right? Yeah. You play the groom and you're marrying his daughter. Right. You know, what's I mean, his name? Moondog? Moondog. Moondog in the movie, right? Yeah, and, he, and he's a stoner and he's a poet and he's a free spirit. And my character's a square. Right. <laughs> he hates that his daughter's marrying a square. He hates it. Everyone knows this is my daughter. Me and my mini boo's daughter. Oh, They're gonna be handing away the bride-to-be right now. A little family tradition we got before we hand over any daughters in our yeah. family. He's gotta... Oh, 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 what are you doing? The other side, it's not bad. Like five inches flat. Ah, Mr. Ray, you're Mike, sir. Thank you. Pardon the interruption. We'd like to thank Mr. Moondog for that presentation. He's a method actor, at least in this he was. I assume he is in other stuff. He uh, was, would give me hostile looks on set, and it took me a while to figure out that he, he's, I, I thought I made him upset. You're the son here. Oh, oh, he's just playing through the role. Oh you know? my gosh. It took me forever to figure it out. Actors like Matthew and um, McConaughey and uh, Isla Fisher are pheno they're phenomenal. I mean, they are amazing, amazing mm -hmm. at their at their craft. With people who work at that level, they bring such incredible focused intensity mm -hmm. that you can feel the temperature change in the space. Like right. it's it's almost a visceral feeling when they just walk on the set because their energy just pops the whole thing. Right. And imp improvising intimidated me. I can do it. But working, you know, I got I get intimidated by that kind of thing. I get yeah. starstruck easily, you know. Sure, sure. But they make it easy because they essentially create this current mm -hmm. and you just have to keep up with the current. And I just remember having a moment in that first take where I'm like, all right, I'm standing here with Snoop Dogg, who's, by the way, really friendly, <laughs> really, really funny guy, right. really friendly guy, wonderful guy. I'm standing there next to Snoop Dogg, who's the officiate at the wedding. <laughs> right, right. <That> makes sense. <laughs> and I got, I'm looking at Isla Fisher here, and I got McConaughey, you know, one of the biggest movie stars in the world, grabbing my crotch. I had this surreal <laughs> moment of like, what is going on? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and again, having that escape from daily life it felt like a, a reward. You know, it's ironic because I started out the interview by telling you, know, I haven't worked in a while. I'm not sure why, I just haven't been booking. I think part of it might be my home life has improved so much. I wonder if part of it is just that, you know, I don't have that desperation to get out of the house that I used to have. What changed? You know, what, what, what happened, you know, with your sons? I worked hard to get services for them. So they have respite services and um, personal care services therapies of course and that took a lot of pressure off. Noah is you know as I said earlier he's he's a happy kid. 
<laughs> you know, he's not advancing, which is tough, but he doesn't care. Hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah, I yeah. care, but he doesn't care. So I got, I have, you know, you got to take that as a, as a win, as hmm. a victory. Yeah. He's not in a medical situation that's really horrible for him. He's, he's fine. He's comfortable. Yeah, he's comfortable. He's, yeah. and he's living his best life as far as he's concerned. Aiden is a little different story. You know, he, he was much higher functioning than Noah in terms of communication and, um, you know, hitting his milestones and everything else. But um, he went through some weird stuff uh, that we didn't know what was going on. When he was around three, he started having panic attacks when he'd mm. hear people laughing, which was really strange. Uh, he could laugh, and even if he heard Noah laugh, that didn't bother him. But if grown-ups laughed, it terrified him. And of course, the irony of me doing comedy, and now I've got a kid who can't stand laughter. I'm right, like, yeah. You can't, can't make that up. And he got over that after about a year or so, but then he started really, really enjoying seeing his parents get upset. For some reason, that really fueled him, it motivated him. Hmm. So if he could find a way to make us angry and yell, if he could find a way to even, I hate to say it, but if he could find a way to even break up, make us cry, hmm. he really liked that. Hmm. No idea why. And you could be patient for like eight hours, and no, I'm not gonna give it to him, I'm gonna redirect him, I'm gonna do this. But if he spends the whole day trying to find a way to upset you, eventually he's going to. For about a year, if he saw a baby, oh, yeah. he would hit the baby. Not yeah. hurt the baby. He wasn't trying to hurt the baby. He would just run over and be like, you know. And the baby mostly didn't notice, except for one who cried, but she was being dramatic. Um, <laughs> you know, some babies are like such drama queens. <laughs> but he, uh, and so we'd go into a doctor's office and he'd, he was about seven at this time. He'd say, you got to hit the baby, hit, hit. And he'd run across the room. I'm like, I didn't know. And I'd try to stop him. And he'd just plunk the baby. And of course, if you think the parents got upset, you would be wrong because they went nuts. <laughs> you know, the parents went crazy. Yeah. Sometimes they were understanding and they were fine. And sometimes they were, especially like, especially they're exhausted, they're pissed off. And something like that happens. And then I've got to intervene, crisis intervention, try to calm the situation. And part of the thing you have to do is you can't ignore the behavior. He wants me to freak out at him, mm -hmm. but I can't not freak out at him. Right. He just hit a baby. Yes. I can't say to the parents, like, don't worry, just ignore him. It got to a point I got so used to it, I had to put on a show. Mm. I was so used to him doing it, I wasn't even angry at him anymore. I was just like, here we go again. Aiden, how could you? Don't you ever do You know, right. because if I didn't do it, you know, that's the only thing that calmed the parents down. He also started getting angrier and angrier and angrier, and suddenly he was becoming actually violent. Hmm. And he would beat us up, and he, you know, the poor respite aid, she would say, you gotta, you gotta take him because he's hitting me. So that became a big challenge, what do we do? The long and short of it is, we realized we couldn't take care of him anymore. We couldn't keep him safe. We couldn't keep other people safe. He had outmatched us, we were, he had won. Hmm. And he, um, you know, he, he started doing more and more extreme things. He tried to jump out a window just to get me upset, uh, second floor. Mm. He uh, escaped on his scooter one day and drove it into a canal in the middle of December when it was really cold. I saw him climbing out of a canal, <sighs> shivering, yeah. soaking wet, laughing hysterically. <laughs> I ran down to him and he said, and this is how he, he talks in second person, so he'd say, did you ride your scooter into the canal? And I was like, oh no. Yeah. His shoes were gone, his socks were gone because they got sucked off in the mud. Oh no. And this is sort of, you know, this was a huge warning to me too. If he hadn't climbed out while I was there, I wouldn't have known he was there. But I also realized, oh, I can't keep him safe anymore. I was with him, I had eyes on him. Right. And he still managed to do this. We started what turned out to be a six month process. We knew it was time. We had to get him into a group home because there's nothing we could do for him anymore. That was a hard decision, but we knew it was the only, and we, Karen and I both were on the same page about it. I hated doing it. Yeah, I'm but, not sure, I'm sure. You know, you don't want to, but we were like, he's destroyed our house. We can't even, you know, decorate the house at all. There's holes in the walls. He was so angry all the time. He hurts everybody. Like, what are we doing? We got him into a group home and uh, that's where he is now. And he's doing better. He's, he's got some switches and medication. He's happy. He does have meltdowns still, but nothing like he used to. He's in a safe environment, a wonderful place. Yeah. He's now in a place where he doesn't have a meltdown every time we talk to him. Hmm. So that's an improvement, and we're hoping we can start visiting him soon. 
uh, take him home for like a weekend or something. That would be great. But we're playing it by ear. But it was it was the right decision for him. It was the right decision for us. We could clean up the house. We can get it repainted. We could put pictures on the wall without him knocking them down and breaking them. Yeah. We could finally have a home again. Yeah. So everybody wins. Now, yeah, there is like I miss him. Hmm. I feel weird not being with him. I'll think of I'll see an old video or think of him in a younger context, and it's yeah. really really hard. It's really hard because. I know we're doing the right thing for everybody, but sometimes it really, you know, yeah. it just feels like you're getting stabbed, you know? Hey, I love him so much. I mean, it's, course, it's not, yeah. it's not, I mean, I couldn't that's stand not, him, but there's no, <laughs> there's no question about that though. Yeah. You know, you're always going to be his dad, you know? And, and, and I tell everybody mm -hmm. this, it, it's, it's devastating in a way, but it's, but it's much better. I'll take that, that heartbreak yeah. any day mm -hmm. over how it was when he was with us. Mm. I mean, no matter how hard the decision, you've regained some of your yourself, right? Yes, you, yes. And your wife too, Karen. Karen is, you know... You both have uh, we're doing kind of so come out of like now. almost flourishing yeah. uh, in, in some regards. We have. I mean, you know, our marriage is really strong. We have a very active social life. We have a very strong community in our lives which we're very grateful for. She's, um, she's working and doing great. Uh, this album that we released, we wouldn't have been able to finish it under the circumstances we were in before. So we were able to do that. Hmm. Uh, we're still having a lot of money trouble that we're slowly coming out of, but that can go on for a while. I do a lot of uh, day trading with uh, options. Oh. And I don't know if you've heard about options I've heard about it, I don't really know anything. So it's like, there's two sides to it. You have the calls and you have the puts. If you think the market's gonna go down, you buy something called a put contract. You don't actually own the stock. So you don't have to actually pay as much money, which is really and nice. It expires, if it's above that $80 strike price, then you can get the full value. Right. The price of the stock was way up to like $120. You could, I only really told you about the call side. There's also the put side. So like if and you believe it's going to go down, then you can buy, get a strike price. But instead Drop. of get, and then you're going to definitely be in the money if it drops down. Played options. And it was like every contract I bought, I made tons of money. And let's say you bought it for a thousand, then so then you've made quite a profit, and you actually haven't even gotten to the. Um, you haven't even. But wait, there's more. You know, I'm getting older and um, money situation is improved, but it's still a, it's still a concern. Um, I and told you about options. I <laughs> 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 should have laughed there. So, uh, have I told you about options? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, you did. I remember it. You told me a lot about options. The other concern is just that, you know, to be in that situation and to be like, I'm not working and I'm trying to. That's frightening too. Mm -hmm. So, um, and this is part of my struggle. Uh, but you know, it's like I have so much that I to be grateful for. So much is going so well, and the money thing, which is always you know sort of you know shading me a little bit, is uh, is something that you know I'm going to come to. The, something's going to work out with it. It's going to work out. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it is a little frightening, you know, to sure. be at this age and and still worrying about that, um, especially knowing that. The kids are not going to be independent. Yeah, you know yeah, that's always that's, a concern. That is really tough. What do you say to people out there who mm -hmm. are are feeling hopeless right now? I mean, you don't know how long you're going to be in a dark position, um, and when you're in it for a long time, you feel like it's never going to go away. That, that especially if you're constantly making effort to get out of it and not getting out of it. Yeah. And I, people become hopeless. I get it. People become really dark. I get it. And I would say like, don't shame yourself. Don't feel bad. Like just get through the day, whatever that looks like. Yeah. Get through the day. I, I don't want to encourage bad behavior, but I got to say like, if anybody came to me and said, you're eating too many chips, you got to, I'd be like, go to hell. Yeah. Leave yeah. me alone. People feel guilt and that makes it worse. They they're ashamed of their coping mechanisms. That makes it worse. Yes. That doesn't help when you're in the dark. Your job is to get through the day. Oh, this is a piece of advice I could probably give if people are in the dark. People want to help people. Most people want to help. Yeah. They don't know how. So that's when they, they say things like, if you need anything, let me know, because they don't know how to help. Right. But you know, it's such an empty gesture from the person who's hearing that, because it's like, well, I don't, what could you do? Yeah, yeah what can what, you do? Right. But if, if there is anything, people don't like to ask for help. If you do, 
If there is something you need, people will dive at the opportunity to help you. Because I sure. think most people want to help other people. Yeah. So, you know, I would say ask for help yeah. as much specifically as you can. That's the other thing. Yeah. Um, accept generosity. A lot of people don't want to do that. Accept gifts, accept help, accept charity. Hmm. Find any resource you can, whatever it takes. That's, that's the best I can give. And in terms of other parents who are in my situation, um, you know, I, I hesitate to give advice beyond that, but um, situations don't last forever. Sometimes they last way longer than you think they should, but they don't last forever. Hmm. There's possibilities now because hmm. I had that experience. That's true. Yeah. Rather than the opposite. So, that's... and I never would have had that perspective even three years ago, four years ago. Right. Seeing you now, like you just, you seem a lot freer as a person, you know, you just, yeah. like, a, like a big weight's been taken off your shoulders um, and you can have some, you know, joy to look forward to. You never told me before you noticed that. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's interesting that you noticed that, but, um, yeah. you know, coming out of fight or flight, when you're in fight or flight for a decade, you come out of it like, and I'm still in it a little bit. I get triggered very easily. Of course. I get, sh I get shot back to that men's I mean, state. Like, all it takes is Noah waking up in the middle of the night and making a noise. Not even crying, just, ah. I wake up with, you know, yeah, yeah. in that mode, adrenaline through the roof. You were at war. I mean, it was, it, a, war. It was a war for 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's PTSD. It, and, you know, it is. It's PTSD. Man, I, I appreciate you being like so vulnerable and everything. Thank you. Um, any last minute plugs? Yeah, um, uh, the acting website is actorjoshuaritter.com. The band website is moderndayalchemy.band. So go to the sites, check me out. It was really great catching up with an old friend and learning about how he managed to balance his career with these huge challenges at home. Thomas Fuller once said, the night is the darkest just before the dawn. It's just that some of us don't know how long that night is going to last. In Josh's case, many times he was just trying to make it through the day. But ultimately, so much good came out of the decade-long struggle. Thank you for watching. Until next time. What the hell are you guys doing in my house? Get out of here!